Hi everybody, welcome to TIA Now, I'm Clarence Reynolds. It's been 10 years since the advent of software-defined networking. In that time period, SDN has emerged as an essential component of the drive toward virtualization. One of the pioneers of SDN is Nick McEwen, professor of electrical engineering and computer science at Stanford University, and he joins us with a look at SDN at 10. Nick, thanks for being with us. Nice to be here, great to be so, here. Tell me about SDN, how did it get started? Well, there were many threads that came together at about the same time, but basically it was born from a frustration that people had with the way in which they would build networks. If you were building a network 10 or 15 years ago, you had to build it from the same equipment that everybody else had. And then all the equipment did the same thing, and all of the features and capabilities were baked into that equipment. So what people needed to do in order to customize that network to meet their needs, if they were operating, a, a owning and operating a large network, then they would have to build all kind of clumsy scripts sitting on top, using these clunky CLIs for controlling this equipment. It was as if, if you wanted to do anything intelligent and smart, you had to do it yourself. But there was no easy way to do that. So there was this sort of pent up frustration. Now I'm an academic, and I was just observing this from the, from the outside, and we were asking ourselves, you know, why is it that it is so hard to introduce new ideas into networking so that those who own and operate networks can customize them to do the thing that they need to do? Because there's no reason to think that AT&T and Google and my local coffee shop all need to run their network the same way. Why can't they customize it to, to, to meet their needs? And it was as if the vendor community was holding on to the keys and didn't want to let them go. Understandably, that's what they should have tried to do. Uh, but what happened with SDN was a handing over of the writing and the ownership of the software so that those who own and operate networks can decide for themselves how that network operates. They can change it, customize it, modify it, and so that they don't need to use these sort of funny, clunky little scripting languages. It was to actually lift it up into a more modern process. That's really what SDN has been about. The rest is the details, but that at a high level, it's changing who's in charge, changing who's in control. So how did the technology itself emerge yeah. from that need? Uh -huh. Well, um, at that time, about 12, 13 years ago, I had a PhD student, Martin Casado, who's kind of famous in networking now. At that time, he had come up with this idea that a, the, the network on Stanford campus, as a enterprise network, if, if you like, that that network would be much more easily and simply managed and, and controlled if you centralized all of that control into one location. We, we identified 2,000 switches in wiring closets across Stanford campus. It's not a very big campus, but 2,000 of them. And every one of them had a CPU, an operating system, protocol stack running on it all just to keep the traffic going, the plumbing going across the, across the, 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 the university. And he asked the question, if you're trying to make all of this work, why do you need 2,000 CPUs, 200 network administrators, just to keep the plumbing going? What if instead we were to take all of that software and move it into a central location, and then every time someone wanted to communicate either within the campus or to the outside world, we'll recognize that flow, we'll apply our policies for our campus, and there were 137 policies that we identified. We'll check out whether that actually is allowed, and then we will install all of the, kind of the, all of the rules that we need to allow it through the network. Now, you could argue whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. It was a kind of a thought experiment. When we did this, we built this on a, on a, on a scale that we had a few hundred users on the, on the campus. We quickly learned that 2,000 CPUs could be replaced with one the 200 network administrators could be replaced with 10. So you could hugely simplify the complexity of running a network, and if you needed to upgrade it, there was just one place you needed to upgrade it, improve it, and so if we could make this available on college campuses, wouldn't that be a fantastic thing? It would reduce the cost, and it would allow researchers and students to be able to try out new ideas, and then the networking industry could take those ideas and benefit from it. it just seemed like an obviously good idea to us. So we went around and talked to the networking equipment vendors, and they hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and they hated it. They thought we were full of shit, right? Because the reason is, it took away that thing which they were controlling and owning and handing it to those who own and operate networks. And so many of these disruptions that happen in networking and, in, and IT are really about who's in control 
And this was just handing the control to those who own and operate the networks. At the same time and in parallel, Google and Amazon and others were already using merchant switching silicon and beginning to build their own networking equipment because they wanted to be in control. And they said from the beginning, yeah, it saves us money, but it's primarily about being in control. Google reported at ONS in, I think it was 2012, they doubled the utilization of their network, of their backbone network, the biggest private backbone network in the world, because they'd taken control of the software, they'd written the software that defined its behavior. And so in some ways that was the first big example, and then many others have followed in various ways, in their own way, because they've customized and tailored it to their own environments. Today, Google's network works very differently from Amazon's and Facebook's and AT&T's and China Mobile's, et cetera, because they're able to customize it. We kind of take it for granted nowadays that they can, they can do that. But 10 years ago, that was a pretty shocking revolutionary idea. How did SDN begin to intersect with open source? Yeah, from the beginning, um, the, I think it was pretty clear that if there was going to be software, it, was, it needed to be of high quality. And there's two ways that you could do it. You either have people who can build proprietary software that's production ready and production worthy, and, um, or you create an open source ecosystem so that everybody shares the resource of, shares the, shares the effort of developing and then making it have the quality that you need to deploy it. So both of those things have happened. Um, VMware, who wasn't previously in the networking business, got into networking through NSX and the products that it, that it built. And then in the open source community, from the beginning, my students, other people's students, eventually Open Daylight, and uh, then Big Switch, and a few others started to build open source. There was Open vSwitch, which is the hypervisor switch inside the Linux, uh, Linux kernel. And that it sort of gradually started to pop up. And then there were more concerted efforts. Open Daylight, Onos from ONF, Cord, ONAP. So all these sort of open source pieces started to emerge. As people realized that you could build open source software that was of sufficient quality that you could put it into your network. And at this point, there's been a sort of a flourishing of all of these different uh, open source projects. Some are fledgling, some are small, some will probably go away, some are bigger, some are huge, right? And um, so we'll see over the next few, few years, I think more of them, but probably are focusing in on the ones that really help in order to build a, a, a network that someone can trust, but that they can customize to meet their needs in their environment. As network operators are beginning to transform their, their, their networks mm -hmm. and, and toward virtualization, how is SDN playing a role in those efforts? In a variety of ways. Um, the, if, you, if you look at some of the announcements from, from AT&T, Deutsche Telekom, Telefonica, China Mobile, et cetera, you can see that they, um, you know, at the end of the day, they need to make their networks more secure, more reliable, and more cost efficient in the way that they operate that network. If they're all running the same protocols, as everybody else, and if they're all operating in an environment where the software is closed and off limits to them, then they can't continue to squeeze value to make their network more reliable, more secure, more cost efficient. And it's much harder for them to differentiate from each other. So I always like to use the example, imagine that AT&T and Verizon are both competing for the US government's business. Today they go with the same boxes, running the same protocols and same features, and they have to try and persuade them that theirs is better. It's an impossible task, right? And the equipment vendors knowing this keep putting the prices up and up and up, right? And that's how it was in the, in the past. If they own the software that defines the behavior, then they can say, mine is better because my features are better and I can deliver you a better service. I can change and modify and evolve my service, either in the software that controls it or down in the forwarding plane that determines how the packets are processed. If I can deliver to you a constantly evolving and improving product, then, hey, I, go, I deserve to win your business. So it's about allowing them to differentiate, to provide a better network. And so ultimately the internet benefits, the customer benefits, the operator benefits, we all benefit by having a higher quality network. How will projects like Cord and P4 mm -hmm. yep. impact the future of SDN? In different ways. Um, so P4 is about having a, an unambiguous way to, dis to declare how packets should be processed in a network. Um, in a way it's a sort of chapter two of SDN. 
chapter one was about the control plane moving into software, and Cord is is as a way for the mobile, the residential, and the operator networks to have a common platform that they can use for 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 controlling their networks. And so Cord provides a sort of a common platform that they can customize and tailor to particular types of, of area. And so the more operators that get behind Cord as a way of doing it, the higher quality it will be, and therefore the, the more production you know, uh, ready and, uh, and deployer it'll be. Once you've got that, that control plane, you still need to decide how the packets will be processed. So you need a contract between that control mechanism all the way down to the forwarding plane. And P4 and P4 runtime give you a way of having that contract. By now, P4 is a, an ecosystem that has you know, 100 companies involved. It runs on many, many different platforms, software, hardware, FPGAs, ASICs, programmable chips. So the whole variety of, of, of different targets that it can go on. And so as a consequence, by, by now you can have a contract that you can take and run on a variety of different parts of your network. So if you're running a big network like Google's or AT&T's that has many different types of forwarding element, you've got a common way of expressing that, that, that behavior. The net consequence of all of this is, it means whoever owns and operates the network decides the behavior that they want and then they drive that downwards, they compile it downwards. And so they're declaring and defining how they want their network to operate. And so that's how it'll influence the operators primarily. In terms of the practical steps that they all get there, as you've seen the operators and AT&T's big announcement recently, they're saying, we're gonna build our own boxes. They'll have hardware that's programmable, they'll have software which they own and control. It'll allow them to tailor their network and their network should get better because of it. We hope so. Well, Nick, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure. And thank you for joining us. You can see more videos on our website at tianow.org and of course on our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.